It's Masters Week here on Squawk Box, and this morning we are joined by the master of doom and gloom. I see how we're getting into that. Joining us now on the Squawk Newsline, Mark Faber is the editor of the Gloom, Boom, uh, and Doom Report. Um, Mark, it's good to, to hear from you. We, we'll, uh, hopefully you can extend some of the comments you've been quoted on uh, in, in recent weeks that eventually uh, a lot of us are going to be facing the, the same situation that, that uh, Cyprus faced. What do you mean, that there's depositors around the world that are going to get a haircut because there's just not enough money to, to pay everything off? Well, I think in general what has changed is that the mentality before the crisis in 2007 and after the crisis was let the taxpayer bail out the system and now the asset holders will have to contribute of course, in the case of banks, first the shareholders, then the bondholders, and then the depositors. And what we've seen in the case of Cyprus, there is a strong redistribution uh, impact in the sense that large depositors are penalized much more than small depositors. You have made the point that when central banks... Um, sort of do a, a bailout or a bail-in, whatever you want to cause it, that, that wealthy people are, are really the beneficiaries because they're the asset owners, and that that has caused income disparity uh, to get too wide basically around the world, and that sooner or later that's going to have to reverse itself. Is that still what you believe? And, and how much do you think that uh, the asset owners, what kind of haircut, eventual haircut, will, will they all take? Will it be 30 40 percent globally? Well, I think I've been thinking about this uh, extensively. I think if you have all your money in the bank, eventually you may lose like 40, 50 percent or 60 percent, depending on the quality of the bank and how you hold your deposit. You understand? If you hold, say, a deposit in Singapore, in Singapore dollars, I think that Singapore dollar deposit is relatively safe. But if you hold a U.S. dollar deposit in a Singapore bank, they place it in the interbank market, and that deposit may not be safe. So it will also become an issue, how do you hold cash with the banks? Now you may argue, okay, I don't want to have any money with the banks at all. I keep it all in treasuries. Well, one day the Treasury Department may, may decide to impose withholding taxes on interest payments to foreigners, or one day they may print that much money that the treasury market collapses, or there could be a default. Nobody knows precisely how the game will be played out. But in general, I believe that well-to-do people that benefited from the money printing essentially, and the easy monetary policies since the early 1980s, that they will have to give back some of their money, either through taxation or through revolution or through expropriation. Hmm. Well, it, this doesn't sound like, in your view, that, that we're on the cusp of, of a secular bull market in, in equities, uh, or if we are, that there's a day of reckoning. How far off? Mark. Well, basically, we can't be at the beginning of a bull market because the bull market, as of today, is more than four years old. It began in, uh, on March 6, 2009, and we're now in April 2013. Also, the economic recovery in the U.S. began in June 2009, and we're now 2013, so we're four years old into an economic expansion. A very weak one, I may uh, point out, because all the money printing that is going on and the asset purchases by central bank, uh, banks does not lead to the money flowing into the so-called main street, into the ordinary Americans. On the contrary, it hurts the ordinary Americans because prices are going up, but it flows into asset markets. So the corporate sector is very cash-rich because the earnings are at the record. No surprise, since, since 2000, 
government debt has grown from $5 trillion to over 16, and we have the unfunded liabilities that are not con counted in that figure. And so the corporate sector is very liquid, but nobody feels like building a new factory. What they do is take over a company like GE today is buying Lufkin. What does it do to the economy if GE buys Lufkin? Nothing. It actually hurts the economy because they're going to lay off some people. But, Mark, we have seen a very strong consumer. That's been the surprising thing through all of this is even though you wouldn't necessarily think the consumer is being helped, they have been incredibly resilient. Yeah, because they continue to borrow. Consumer borrowings are up again. And you have the transfer payments. The deficit is a trillion dollars. That trillion dollar flows into food stamps, into all kinds of disability insurance premiums that people get, and so forth and so on. So that keeps consumption at a relatively high level. But what drives wealth in a system is capital spending and savings. That you should never forget, and not consumption. And that's what uh, that's what's missing. So give me some uh, a little bit of a time frame anyway, uh, Mark, on on when you you see the day of reckoning coming in. And I mean, we went through what we think is is the worst financial crisis that we're going to see in our lifetime. You think this next um, uh, is, situation is, is going to make the last crisis? Um, this is going to exceed that in terms of, of pain and and, uh, and loss. I think it could very well be worse because the next crisis could lead to a deflationary bust and uh, a bust in governments. In other words, we may have a total collapse in confidence in the system and at the same time we have international tensions growing and uh, don't believe that the North Koreans are acting on their own. It's all a test to see the resolution by the Americans and the Japanese and the foreign powers to essentially threat by North Korea. And the Chinese are watching exactly what the reactions are because they're going to do the same in a few years' time. So uh, even though China now is, is, it looks like they're, they're trying to, uh, uh, to talk some sense into North Korea, you think that they're actually, uh, that, that they're in, in cahoots? Of course, everybody knows that in Asia. Uh, maybe the North Koreans do not always go by the agreements, but in general, Look, it's a country that can hardly produce bicycles. They have practically no industries. How can they have nuclear technology? How can they supply weapons to Iran and so forth and so on? It's like in the time of the Cold War. The Russians used to, the Bulgarians to do the dirty work. <clears throat> the Chinese are using the North Koreans. Mm. All right, uh, Mark. But anyway, yeah, I ahead. think in time frame... Mm -hmm. Near term, the market is overbought, and I think we could, on the S&P, make a new high, but with very few stocks making new highs, because a lot of stocks have not performed well and are already down significantly from their highs that were either reached in January or even last November. And we have every day some important stocks that are breaking down, like recently Oracle, or Federal Express and so forth. So I don't think that we are at the beginning of a bull market. Now, can we go up just because of a few stocks, Johnson & Johnson, Procter & Gamble, Walmart and so forth? Possible. But I think if we continue to move up, the possibility or the probability of a crash becomes higher sometimes in the second half of this year. So I don't think it's a very good time to buy stocks. Okay. Uh, Mark Faber, we, uh, we appreciate it.